one general of the U.S. Army once said one of the worst things in the battlefield is not to know what you're dealing with. And I totally agree with that. So now that we know, you know, what is the issue that we're dealing with and that we are re really in, 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 in a battlefield against, you know, seizures and, and, and non-convulsive seizures, and we know that we need to intervene aggressively, what did we do now that we know what the gaps are in terms of uh, the, the operation, you know, how can we satisfy uh, you know, uh, uh, patient care with this uh, newer technology? Can we incorporate the technology in our practice? And the answer is yes. So this was actually our uh, proposal, right, uh, to deal with this issue, right, to deal with the uncertainty. And when you're dealing with uncertainty for patients, right, that's pretty bad. You know, you, you, you don't know what you're doing. That's really bad for the patient. So we sat down as a group, multidisciplinary group. There were critical care doctors, there were um, neurologists, uh, there were uh, epileptologists, there were uh, epilepsy techs, there were house staff, fellows, residents, and nursing staff. And we incorporated all these people, all these leaders, you know, from these different specialties. And we said, you know, we have this proposal. And by the way, this is our experience, right? This is not, you know, based on anything. This is what we decided to do based on, um, you know, some reports from in, in, in the literature and what people had done, but we decided to approach the problem in this fashion. And when you looked at um, the the center of the slide, you will see that we relied on the technology, on the artificial intelligence part of it. And we decided that uh, a burden of 70% in seizure activity given by Cerebell would initiate all of this cascade uh, of, of events, right? We were not relying on uh, epileptologists in the middle of the night, you know, for those, you know, examples of, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Green uh, showed up, uh, you know, before. No, we relied on the AI and then somebody at the bedside will uh, initiate all of these uh, events. Some of the recommendations here are based on guidelines in terms of the antiepileptic dosing, you know, what sort of like agent to use, um, you know, what the follow up would be. And the uh, clinician at the bedside would, would decide, right, if the patient needed an airway or not, intubate the patient, start uh, further sedation and initiate transfer if that's what the patient needed. And then um, based on different burdens, then, you know, we decided to keep the patient in uh, the institution, but we actually only initiated transfer when people really require um, uh, interventions. Yeah, great, Fred. I, and I, Dr. Cote, I just want to point yes. out two, two things, too, if you don't mind. That, that I, the first is I find, I find it fascinating that, uh, you know, if we, we would maybe say greater than 70%, we'll just call that status epilepticus. And if you look at, at the bottom where it says go to step number two, I find it so powerful that the default wasn't high seizure burden send to another center. The default was high seizure burden, try to treat, if unable to treat, transfer. And I think that that's a powerful thing that, uh, that using this technology, we were in fact able to, to treat a handful of patients uh, and keep them, keep them in Inspira. Um, no, Adam, thank you very much for highlighting that. Yes, that, that was a, 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 another important thing about the, uh, uh, the in institution of cerebral is that we were actually treating patients on the basis of the reading. And if we were just not able to do it, yeah. we'll just transfer the patient. That's absolutely right. <laughs>